And Coach Adams said, sometimes when you have great players, it's best you get out their way and let them be great players. On today's Find the Balance Friday edition of the Odd Coaches Podcast, Dr. Adams and Coach Francis interview Nima Overter, assistant men's basketball coach at Coastal Carolina. Coach Overter gives his thoughts on the current state of college basketball and college recruiting in this new environment, as well as shares stories about working with both Dr. Adams and Coach Francis. Welcome to today's show. The Odd Coaches Podcast is sponsored by the CKA Save Project. The CKA Save Project is an industry leader in providing student-athlete academic and athletic support. From assessing student-athletes' academic and athletic skills to measuring and monitoring student-athlete academic progress to improving student-athlete time management and organizational skills, the CKA Save Project provides wraparound services for student-athletes from middle school through college. For more information, visit us on the web at www.ckasaveproject.org or schedule a free consultation with Dr. Keith Adams by emailing cka at ckasaveproject.org. Greetings and salutations and welcome to the Odd Coaches Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Keith Adams, and with me today is my tag team partner, the John Cena to my Shawn Michaels in the WWE, yes, they did team, the icon, the showstopper, the main event and the reason why we are here, Coach Mike Francis and Coach Nima Omavar. Did I get it right? I forgot the did, though. Sorry about that. But fans, Coach Nima and both myself and Coach Francis go back over 20 years, and it's probably more than that. A uh, longtime high school and college coach. He is currently at Coastal Carolina, one of my dream schools, and, and that's a shoot fans. Uh, Nima One, thank you, man, for joining us. Uh, with COVID, it's just been too long. I've been so used to just seeing you somewhere and just breaking bread and having conversations. And I know it's the same with Mike. But but how are you, man? How are you doing? I'm, I'm spectacular. And I, I appreciate both of you gentlemen, um, whether or not you know this, but you both are uh, mentors. You both are heroes. Um, you guys, guys are people that I hold in very high regard. Um, I've met both of you initially in different stages of my life and career and have stayed in contact ever since. And so uh, supporting both of you is, is a, is an honor and a pleasure. Well, well, such, such kind words and, and we both appreciate it. Uh, Nima, can you tell our audience a little bit about your playing and coaching career and kind of get us to the point where you're at Coastal so we can really spend some time on segment two about what you're currently doing. The floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I was not much of a, a, a player. Okay, now I, I went to Damascus High School where Coach Adams uh, beat us by 50 points, didn't didn't uh, let up one bit. Didn't uh, the press off? No. <laughs> you know, long, long, had, long story short. <laughs> you know, Father and Campbell had six points at halftime and decided to score 35 in the second half um, for a total of 41, uh, which is seared in, in my memory. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, the crowd was – Talking trash. I I remember vividly at half. It was their ball coming out at half. They're throwing the ball in. Somebody in the crowd said something stupid. He just looked over his shoulder, gave him a look like, "Oh yeah, watch this," and uh, went on to uh, dominate us. But you know that was, you know that was my first foray and introduction to Coach Adams, which you know. At that time, it's you know you're 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 a high school kid and you, you're getting your ass bust pretty good. It's like wow, that's a really good player. But you don't in, in Montgomery County, we don't have much of a frame of reference of like how good is that player. So like you know that was around the same time as LeBron James in high school, and so you you start saying, well, damn, because following kind of looked and and played like a LeBron James in Montgomery County, and, and that's not an exaggeration for us, for our level and who we were. And then you hear he goes to George Mason, like, damn, I thought he was better than that. Well, then he takes it to the final four. It's like, oh, damn, okay, following Campbell's a bad boy. Um, and I also remember this vividly when my playing career uh, was, was at, you know, at a halt and I was coaching. I'm, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. But I was, at, uh, I was at Sherwood High School coaching summer league for Damascus. 
And um, I was at that point coaching Deontay Twyman uh, in AAU. And I asked Coach Adams one time, we were standing on the baseline watching another game. I said, Coach, how did you coach Fowler and Campbell? Like, you know, just tell me, like, give me some info, give me some intel. And Coach Adams said, sometimes when you have great players, it's best you get out their way and let them be great players. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but I, I remembered that vividly because as a young coach, mm-hmm. and, and by the way, Damascus High School, Coach Cook, love him to death, but our team was not great. You know, he coached us hard. We had a lot of sets. We had a lot of plays. So that's That was my, you know, context of like, hey, this is what coaching should be. Run a lot of plays. Run a lot of sets. And, um, you know, Deontay was playing AAU for me, you know, that spring and summer. We're trying to find him a, a scholarship. And it was like, hey, Deontay, take the ball. Go do what you do, dog. Like, you know, and, and there was a – we played in the Charlie Weber – tournament when we didn't even have matching jerseys. Charlie well. Deontay had like 35 one game, you know, and it was just like, yeah, do this, do that. Like I'm just waving my hand. Like I'm not really coaching. I'm just letting Deontay do his thing. So, you know, that's something that um you know kind of helped frame my reference in coaching very early on. Uh while I was at Damascus High School and coaching summer league at Damascus, I got to coach I went to Frederick Community College trying to play ball, figured out really quickly I'm actually not that good. And that's why I pursued uh, coaching as uh, instead and uh, was asked to coach um, uh, the Jewish Day School in, in Brockville, Maryland. Um, and, you know, Jewish Day, we uh, were exactly what it sounds like, a small, private Jewish school, not much of a basketball history tradition. But, you know, that was my, you know, Los Angeles Lakers and I poured my heart and soul into it. Um, and our first year, we won the, the league PVAC championship. Second year, we went to the championship game, lost at the buzzer beater. Cedric Lindsay, who ultimately went on to Gonzaga and played at Richmond, made that buzzer beater. So for four years, uh, subsequent after that, while well, I had a little bit of a relationship with him and his father, I constantly told him how, how much of a, a grudge I held against them. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the time that I, you know, said, okay, I love what I'm doing. I love being a coach. Um, I love helping. Uh, at that point, I didn't even call them young people. I just love helping people because I was young too. I was 19 by my second year. And, uh, you know, I want to do this for a living. And I was a head coach. So I, I made a conscious decision. I want to learn from the best to be the best. And I decided to become an assistant coach at St. John's College High School in, in Washington, D.C. I then on, went on to Paul VI Catholic High School when the program was uh, really, you know, not known like it is today. And so um, I, I utilized what I learned from my time at Jewish Day, what I um, thought I knew, because at that time I really didn't know what I was doing, uh, to, to help Coach Ferrello build a program that is now a national powerhouse. And that's where I developed a, another subsequent passion beyond just helping uh, young men and players realize their goals and dreams, but building programs and, and you know what goes into it. Um, I really became addicted to that grind uh, to where like I shy away from if something's a ready-made product, cool, y'all can have that. I'm going to go over here, build this thing up and come kick your ass. So that was, um, you know, the, the, the first taste of that uh, in, in kind of the, the big stage, if you will. Um, I all along had, had gone with I-270 Road Warriors, um, had, a, had a really good group of Montgomery County kids and had a, a series of college coaches that I got to know through networking that said, hey, you might want to join up with this other group. They can help you in more ways than one. Yeah, it sounds good. Don't want to do that. No. Then Sidney Johnson came along, who was at Georgetown, said, well, you know, they can help you, but more so they can help those kids you're coaching more than you can because you're a 21-year-old know-it-all. And he was absolutely right. And so that's when, when I made that decision to, okay, let me join forces with a a group that's on the rise that has a similar vision as me, that was not a ready-made product. Again, mismatching jerseys, carpools in, in our cars to get to where we're going, 
um, you know, gym time all over the place where we can get free uh, practice time, sometimes on outdoor courts. You know, that's, you know, the humble beginnings where we started from. Fast forward to today, folks know Team Takeover is the preeminent EYBL uh, organization that has won multiple PGMs, sent multiple young men to the NBA, countless others uh, to scholarships. So um, that was my, my high school journey. I then was able to go to uh, UNC Charlotte as a grad assistant. And, and how that came about was, uh, you know, me marketing and branding our program and pushing the word out there to college coaches through email marketing. I, I, I proudly wear the badge of honor that I was one of the first to, to mass email college coaches. Now I, I, I set the trend when, when there's, I, I get about 20 emails a day. I read them all. I reply to as many as I can because I know the amount of effort and work that goes into that. Um, and college coaches all over the place probably uh, sigh when they get another one of these emails. But that's another person's hopes and dreams that's sitting in our inbox. I don't take that lightly. Um, and so through the first mass email I sent out, I had five people respond back. OK, um, of those five, I've, I've worked for two of them and Bobby Lutz and Daryl Brooks at Bowie State. That was actually my first two jobs. Daryl Brooks was at George Washington. And he and I built a relationship at that time. So was at UNC Charlotte for a year. We were let go um, after our first year. So now I learned what college basketball business is all about. We won 19 games and they showed us the door. Um, went to Bowie State University where, uh, you know, we were very, very good. Uh, we were finished sixth in the country that year. Um, had a young man ended up playing for the Lakers. Uh, which was, you know, a big deal, uh, played with their G League team. And we had six other young men go on play professionally uh, while almost everybody, and I say almost, there's one out there who will get a copy of this this episode so that he knows I'm still going to put my foot up his behind if he don't finish this year, um, get their degree. And so that, you know, that was an exciting, you know, prospect. Um, that kind of – season and and everything I had done to that point, the body of work that I had uh, with all the marketing and, uh, you know, social media, that was what really put me in a position to get hired by Mark Godfrey at NC State. And, uh, you know, three seasons there uh, in the ACC, three NCAA tournaments, including one Sweet 16, um, was a big deal. You know, it was a big deal. And this was, again, a rebuild situation where a team – had not gone to the dance for the previous, I believe, six seasons. Um, and in our first year, we took them to the Sweet 16 with just, you know, a couple of additions, uh, you know, retooling some things, uh, bringing in a, a, a culture of, of work. Uh, that That's what really put us uh, into that uh, national spotlight. Uh, went to University of Maryland after, after those three uh, NCAA tournaments. Very similar situation five-year tournament drought, you know, Coach Turgeon at that juncture, uh, the rumor was he was on the hot seat. That don't scare me none, Coach. Let's go get this thing done. First year, NCAA tournament, tournament win. Following year, Sweet 16. Following year, back to the tournament. So you could see within those that seven-year period of going to the NCAA tournament um, out of eight between those three institutions, all three were not – uh, NCAA tournament teams prior to arriving, but taking the knowledge that I had gathered from a lot of wise uh, men and women, because uh, we had some women in staffs as well in some of these places, um, we were able to, you know, build, you know, the word culture is thrown around a lot, but we were able to build winning cultures. And it wasn't the same type of culture in each place. Each institution was unique in what it needed, we, we figured that that riddle out pretty early and we put that solution in place to allow us to go to the NCAA tournament. And then from there, I, uh, you know, wanted to try something different and went to South Alabama, University of South Alabama, where uh, I was there for a season. I went to George Washington University, where I was there for a season. I went to Fordham University, where I was there for a season. And now here I'm at Coastal Carolina. And I 
don't shy away from the fact that I was at those institutions for one year. Um, for one, the people that know who's good at what they do the best are coaches, thus us in the trenches. So, you know, I, you know, it's humbling to have opportunities and offers to, you know, to be able to, to move up in the, in the coaching ladder. And, um, you know, not for nothing, you know, some situations worked out, some of them didn't. And I'm grateful for those, uh, you know, moments because it taught me when I become a head coach, what to do and what not to do how to treat people and how not to treat people. And that's, you know, really shaped my belief and convictions on um, kind of where I am today and why I'm here today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here today because I work for a Hall of Famer in Cliff Ellis, uh, who is a winner, um, who can help me achieve my goals and dreams as, as much as I've done to help others achieve their goals and dreams. I really wanted to put myself in a situation where the, the person that's going to advocate for me for what uh, could be my next move, which would hopefully be a head coaching opportunity, would would be someone that uh, not just knows what he's doing, but is stamped by having um, you know enshrinement in a in a, a hollowed uh, institution like uh, you know the Hall of Fame. So you know that's what brings me here to the to the beautiful shores of uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and uh, excited to 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 do what we do, win and help young men uh, realize their goals and dreams. All right, Coach Francis, who's known Nima as much as I have. Any thoughts on his uh, journey to Coastal? Because we'll get to Coastal on the second part of the segment, but feel free to react, man. A lot to take in there. I think I might have beat him everywhere except for when he went to TakeOver because we never played TakeOver. But I think I beat him at I-270. I beat him at the Charlie Webb. I beat him when he coached at Paul Six. Nah, I'm just joking. It's great to hear. It's <laughs> memory, Coach Adams. There's documentation. <laughs> nah, documentation nah. of Coach Francis having multiple <laughs> high major players, including a draft pick. No. The basketball team. Nah. I just took the team that was given to me. Nah, nah, nah. nah. He was undefeated. <laughs> no, 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 no. So the thing I do want to talk about is how you challenge. It seems like the lifers are the ones who take that challenge. So many guys are looking to get to that next job and they want it already made. But much like yourself, I, I, my job, first head coach job, they won 52 games in 10 years. And midway throughout our uh, third season, we were already passing that. When I went to Essex, they had canceled the season because they couldn't even play. They didn't have enough players. And I was, you know, coach of the year soon after getting there. Uh, then I went to Old Mill. They were in the bottom of the list. And then, of course, the five years I was there, we had regional championships and three straight county championships. And the challenge of taking a program from where it's at to that next level. I don't think a lot of guys are built for that. You know what I mean? I don't think they're built for it. And to me, it's the most rewarding part of the job, as much as it is the relationship with the kids and seeing their success. But when you can take a program that's at the bottom of the league or like bottom nationally, whatever, and then take them to that next level, it's, it's, it's easy to see why you've been at so many places because that's your resume. That's what you've done. I think, were you at Paul Six in like 2002, 2003? Is that when it was? No, no. When uh, Levi was a coach? No, no. That was, that was, it was after that. So it was. Okay, all right, cool. Six, no, no, no. 2008, nine. Okay, all right. Yeah, AJ was at Gonzaga then. So, but yeah, so it's just that challenge. I, I think. AJ was leading the charge by the student section trying to get <laughs> To uh, miss free throws. Yeah, 2007 to 2009 was when I was at PBI. That's how you know you're getting old. I, I, Yo, I never yes, sir. Old. I guess I'm finally getting to that stage. You had to write it down, Nima. <laughs> I, I, I happen to have it, so, you know, right here next to me. I I, I do. So I looked at at, at my notes. I did. <laughs> that is a perfect segue. So fans, we're gonna take a quick break come back and talk about the Chanticleers of Coastal Carolina and my dreams of, of, of being there as well and just more catching up with our good friend Nima on the Odd Coaches Podcast. 
There is an old business adage that says, what gets measured and monitored gets done. It is also fact that deadlines for action. That is what the CKA Save Project's academic monitoring service can do for student athletes. Measure and monitor their academic progress to improve their grades. Our academic monitoring services provide ongoing academic support for student athletes for a designated period of time. Our academic success coaches work with student athletes on time management and organizational skills, along with improving their ability to self-advocate. Every few weeks, our academic success coaches meet with student athletes to assess their academic progress as well as provide ongoing academic advising. If needed, student athletes have access to CKA learning specialists who provide virtual core subject academic support for student athletes. For more information, visit us on the web at www.ckasaveproject.org or schedule a free virtual consultation with Dr. Keith Adams by email at cka at cka.saveproject.org. Welcome back to the Odd Coaches Podcast. And again, in this uh, Find the Balance Friday episode, we are talking to Coach Nima, who is, that's who he is to us fans. So we want you to be as personalized with him uh, as we are. Uh, I want to say before we start talking about Coastal Carolina basketball and the great opportunity you have there, uh, on a personal note, you have never been afraid to work, Nima. Uh, you have always put work in and even when I was a high school guy and as I transitioned to Hood College, when I really got to kind of hang out with you because I was recruiting where you were, uh, you were always willing to do whatever job was needed. And I think that is so undervalued. And it's a testament to you that so many different people uh, want to work with you. So whether jobs worked out or not, we've all been in the business Um where things haven't worked out. Now, Mike's got to call his own shots. There's times that somebody called the shot for me, but again, it does happen. But I did want to just publicly say how much I've admired just the, the hustle and the grind you've put in. Tell us a little bit about Coastal Carolina basketball. What are we going to see from Coastal? Why was that opportunity just the one for you at this time, sir? Yeah, so, you know, Coastal – Coach Ellis is really the head of my original coaching tree. Okay. I worked for Bobby Lutz. who was a grad assistant for coach Ellis at Clemson. Okay. I developed a really good relationship with Benny Moss when he was the head coach of UNC Wilmington. Benny Moss was also an assistant under Bobby Lutz. Um, when I was coaching AAU, we had Kevon Moore and Brad Ball both uh, commit to UNC Wilmington. And so we, you know, we had that familiarity. I drove kids down uh, to, to visits down at Wilmington. We, we knew each other. When uh, Kyle Neptune was uh, given the opportunity to be the head coach at Villanova, which we are ecstatic about that opportunity for him um, to, to go compete for a national championship at an institution that uh, he, he totally believes in and they believe in him. You know, there was a, uh, you know, it was about a, a week where, was, you know, holding breath, like, oh, my, do we have a job here? What's going to happen? Um, you know, and, and prior prior to coming to Fordham, you know, I, I set out coaching for a year. Um, and that was something that, you know, for someone, as, and, and I, I uh, respectfully and uh, glowingly say it this way, I'm addicted to coaching. I'm addicted to this profession. If you're away from it from a, for a year, you will lose your mind. Um, and so, you know, it's like, man, I coach, coach Neptune's gone. What if someone else gets this job? I can't, I can't be away from this thing. So, um, Bobby Lutz, uh, was very instrumental in, in kind of helping me, uh, get this opportunity, which I'm forever grateful to him again, because he also helped me with NC State. Um, and I was able to to get back into my original coaching family tree, which I thought would be very important um, as I move along in my career. Uh, also, you know, Antonio Day, who's uh, one of our uh, transfers here at uh, Coastal Carolina, played for us at Fordham. I believe in him. I, I know what he can do because I, I saw it firsthand. Um, you know, Antonio came back closer to home, uh, you know, in the middle of the season, uh, he needed to come back closer to home for uh, personal reasons. And, you know, knowing he was here, that made it really easy. 
But then you start looking, you know, a little bit deeper and you say, oh, wow, they actually have been doing some recruiting this offseason. We, ha- we have uh, seven new players. Uh, and I'm sorry, eight new players. And pretty good. Now, it's incredibly difficult to bring eight young men from eight different uh, institutions and, and coaching styles and track records of winning and put them all together for one magical season. Uh, but that's an exciting task because you know what? That's what college basketball is moving forward. We can, you know, folks can boo-hoo about it all they want. That ain't changing. And so, you know, what an unbelievable opportunity to get back in my coaching family tree, work under a Hall of Famer, have a unique and talented group of young men uh, you know, with one of which I know personally and uh, do what um, many in college basketball are going to have to do for the foreseeable future, put together a team year by year and really hone in your craft on how to coach a year by year team. Mike, you coached in uh, junior college. Your teams were year by year. Yes. Here's what it is. People have been doing it for years. Calipari has been doing it forever. <laughs> they ain't making and breaking them. So um, no, no, not you know, at all. All of us four-year institution guys, stop boo-hooing. Ain't nobody crying for it. We got to do what's right for the players, you know, what's best for them. I'm glad that we had this opportunity for all of them. And here we are. So we're yeah. you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna work our tail off to build chemistry, to to build cohesion with our team. Uh, and do what we need to do to be dancing in March. Um, you know, in, in, in the last 11 years, Cliff Ellis has, has won the league championship six times. So I, I, I like those odds. I like those odds. All right. So, so Nima, uh, and stop me if I get too personal with this. You were one of the people who I let know early um, that I was going to step away from Hood and go work on my doctorate. And where there were a lot of prominent folks, and I mentioned that in the book project that I'm going to bring up, who discouraged me to say, wow, you're really going to stop doing something you love and, and are passionate about to help people who may not want your help. You were on the opposite side, and you gave me some very kind words and wished me well. And throughout my book process, you were always available do a survey, answer a question. When you were in town, we caught up, we figured it out. So I wanted to, one, thank you for that. And then two, I did have a chance to send you a copy of the book that you had some role in, in terms of just, thank you, being uh, supportive and and helpful. And although you haven't had a chance to go through the whole thing, any initial thoughts or comments on the Finding the Balance book project, knowing that you lived the coaching career that I talk about within that book. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Well, I know myself. I know I don't have very good balance as it comes to life. It Because for, for me, way too often, it's been all work and not enough other things in life, whether it be family or just taking moments to relax and take deep sighs of relief. Uh, you know, yesterday uh, I was recruiting in the DMV, which is home. And instead of coming home uh, immediately after the event, I got a flight the next morning, went home, saw my mom, saw my dad, saw my sister, saw her boyfriend. We, we played board games. I haven't played board games since I was like in middle school. I had a blast. Holy cow. Why am I not doing that more often? This is... Um, something that, uh, you know, I, I really, you know, I, you know, as I read your book, want to like tap into because um, I plan on doing this for the foreseeable future, the next 40, 50 years, however long I, I have a pulse. Um, and, you know, I joke that, you know, I don't burn the camera at both ends. I burn it at three ends. Um, it's like, you know, work, 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 work. Finding about, I mean, just just that off the title. It, as, as coaches, we need to like learn that because you know some of the best coaches that I've worked for, I've seen them have that balance. And um, you know, we we coaches we put pressure on ourselves that is really artificial. Um, you know, 
I, you know, I've I've heard fans say good things. I've heard say, fans say bad things. I really don't give a damn what fans think. We, you know, if we do our, our part, it, you know, their opinions are are not really that important. What is important are the people in our lives that have taken time to help us get, you know, to these moments and through these moments. Um, you know, to to add to to your point, you know, of of you know supporting your your mission of of becoming Doctor Adams from Coach Adams. Um, you know, for one, you know, you you recruited one of my favorite players, Brendan Strong, to to the hood, and um, you know, through that process, you know, it's like, wow, here's a guy that kicked my ass about three years ago as a coach by fifty. Um, it was was ruthless in that game, but what a kind and caring person in this process of helping realize this young man's goals and dreams to become a college player. And now you look at where it stands today. He is a successful college coach. You know, that comes with, you know, teaching and, and support, um, you know, that came from multiple sources and, and you would be one of those sources. Also, my, my mother um, is a, a doctor as well, Dr. Farahani. She has got a, a, a mass or a, a doctoral in uh, distance education and, and uh, you know, di- you know, online learning. You know, so education in my family means a lot. And, um, you know, we know we, you, you better celebrate those two letters in that period before your name. That means something because um, I saw firsthand one of the people I respect the most of my life, my mother, the type of work and effort she put into getting that title in front of her name. So, um, you know, kudos to you, Dr. Adams, for going, uh, you know, having that mission, completing that mission, and now, you know, imparting that wisdom back to the world. Much appreciated. And uh, Nima and I, uh, fans, most of the time when we did recruiting visits, we actually didn't talk basketball. <laughs> we talked education. We talked life. Uh, Mike, before we close the segment, anything you like to add in response to uh, what, what Nima's talked about? Yeah, it's uh, just going back to his family tree. I mean, his coaching tree, I almost said family tree. It is your family tree now. You know what I mean? Cliff Ellis, I really, really uh, admire him. He was – one of the first guys who made me believe I could do it because uh, the first guy I had on staff who was a guy named Corey Wallace. Uh, I sent you a text. I don't know if you asked coach if he remembers Corey, but uh, they had Corey, Devin Gray, Bo Hain, all them guys was down there. And we used to go see Corey play when he went to Clemson and play for Coach Ellis. But the reason why I had Coach Ellis in high regard is because Coach Ellis didn't play college basketball. And I was told so many times before that because if you didn't play college basketball, you couldn't be a college head coach. And Coach Ellis was the one who uh, debunked that for me. So I've always, you know, kept tabs on what he's done and where he's been and in meeting him through Corey and through Sharon Wright, who got drafted, you know, by the seven sixers and all that. He has great players. Devin Gray, who was from St. Francis, who I had in AAU, who played Clemson and killed Duke freshman a year and uh, leading score and all that his freshman year, and all league, first freshman to ever do it. So I've known Coach a long time. So I look up to Coach Ellis for everything he's did. So I know that, Nima, you're learning a lot. And that um, you're in good hands when it comes to Coach Ellis. And the only thing is, 50? Like, you, you beat him by 50? Uh, let's just say uh, at that time, and hopefully it doesn't happen again, that the Damascus fan base was not as polite as hopefully they are now. And uh, we all hold grudges. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, Nima, and mm-hmm. on the flip side of this, fans, in the next segment – Nima gets to tell the stories about Coach Francis and myself, so I'm going to sneak this story in. Uh, that game was at not at 5.15, if I'm not mistaken, and yeah. we had to take the bus. And for coaches, we hate 5.15 games yes. because the bus is going to come late, and it's a long drive from where I was coaching at to where Nima was playing at, and no matter what you say to the players, they still are going to fall asleep on the bus, okay? And warm-ups, they're just waking up. And 
you guys jumped on us and you did what you're supposed to do. And it was a close game. And I'm waiting to just get to halftime so I can cut my promo. Many fans will know that Coach Adams is a little animated sometimes on the sidelines. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, I had mentioned a few of the things that the fans had said. And then the fans helped me out by reiterating some of those things as uh, our team was about to play. So that really locked in the message. And from there, we were fortunate enough to get a comfortable victory. There we go. So thank you to your fans uh, for continuing to inspire us to play better. And I think uh, I'm going to back out of the segment so I don't say it wrong. And on the other side of this, I can't wait to find out whatever stories Nima are going to tell, mainly about Coach Francis this time. Nah. Most people get me. Nima, we'll right his check still in Montgomery <laughs> County, so he got to back out. <laughs> we'll be right back on the I Coaches Podcast. The reviews are in for Dr. Keith Adams' book, Finding the Balance, My Personal Journey to Academic and Athletic Success. College professor and student-athlete academic expert Dr. Lisa Rubin said, There is nothing out there like this book, so I do hope people will pay attention and give it a read. Former George Mason standout Fowler and Campbell said, Consider this book an opportunity to work directly with Dr. Adams just like I did. I assure you that there will be something you can take away that will be useful to you throughout your personal journey. Ryan Waite, a recent college graduate who is a software engineer, said, I like how the book is based on research, which makes it good for general students as well as student athletes. The book serves as both a memoir to Dr. Adams' 30-year academic and athletic career, as well as an instructional guide to assist student athletes, parents, coaches, teachers, and administrators navigate through the challenges of finding a better balance between academic and athletic success. The book includes over 15 personal stories and anecdotes from Dr. Adams, along with numerous former players and colleagues from a variety of sports and endeavors. You can order your copy at www.ckasaveproject.org. From the main page, simply click CKA Save Project Services and order the Find the Balance book. For more information, contact Dr. Keith Adams by email at cka at cka.saveproject.org. Welcome back to the Odd Coaches Podcast. And in segment three, it's our favorite segment. And this time, we've got somebody that knows both Coach Francis and Coach Adams. Uh, so, Nima, I don't know what direction you want to go in, but you've got creative freedom. What is your best Coach Francis and or Coach Adams story that you have? Because we've been around a long time, and I'm sure it has to do with the hoop group. <laughs> well, it, it, what does that say? Does that say... Uh, I can't, I can't. You know, we got no yeah. bunch of productions, and he got no yeah. upside down. Upside down, too, man. That's my partner. Production value so so all. Now you got he's got the sign upside down. You know, Mike and I. Mike used to bring his teams to all my AAU tournaments. I used to run. Mike supported me um, and believed in me in, in that endeavor. Uh, Mike uh, was a you know a mentor in the sense of you know hey. You know, he's, he's coaching. He's a head college coach at CCBC Essex. I never heard those four letters uh, plus the word Essex uh, before prior to him having the job. Um, but it was an inspiration because prior to that, when, when I met Mike, he was, a, he was a high school coach. He was coaching AAU. And then he, he got an opportunity to go be a college coach. And that's what I was trying to do. It's like, okay, wow. All right. It can be done. Here's an example of someone who did it. And, um, you know, you, then you you, you kind of nestle up to the person a little bit more, like, you know, try to figure out how they did it so that you can maybe replicate it. And, um, you know, through that became, you know, became friends. And, you know, you go to camp, you know, for, for all the young coaches out there and the aspiring coaches, if you're not spending time in the summertime working camp, yeah. Getting paid peanuts, like the pay yeah. is irrelevant. You know, the pay is irrelevant. The the contacts, the friendships, any contact, yes. the friendships that are born through working camp are priceless, are yep. irreplaceable, and you know, it, it's just a testament to what it is today. Now, I alluded to earlier, me beating Mike's team, one and zero all time. We've never played since then. We never will. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we no, 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 we never had. We never had. 
but uh, Mike did lose. Um, but you know, you, you know that that's just you know a game. The the more memorable times are, like I said, spent in the coaching lounge talking about life, talking Let's about break us. <laughs> talking about <laughs> you know the the different ways that that we can impact the game. Um, the very ways we can impact each other and, and how we can help one another. How if one day I got a job, man, I would hire you. Hey, if you got a job, would you hire me? I mean, you know, those that's just fanning the flame of the dream. And, you know, that stuff is healthy when you're in this admittedly unhealthy business, but mm-hmm. you know, a business that is, you know, requires dreams to, to fuel you. Because if you don't have the dreams that you know, you, you know you ain't gonna you ain't gonna make it. You got to be internally motivated, um, and so I believe that we added internal motivation uh, to you know to both of us. And you know, Coach Adams is, or Doctor Adams, I apologize. As you, alluded, <laughs> you'll be the only one to say it because my partner doesn't do it, and if he does, he's doing it as a joke. <laughs> Doctor Coach Adams, uh, you know, Doctor Coach you, Adams. When you, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the surveys, like we, you know, well, I, was, I was, I was young when, when I got to know you, I, I was still in college and, you know, just getting out of college. So I know the type of work and effort that goes into schoolwork. Some other coaches uh, may have forgotten what it's like to, to, to do, you know, long-term projects and assignments. Um, but, you know, that's a really uh, inspiring thing to see, uh, a man, uh, you know, you know, I considered myself at that time a kid, uh, you know, but a, a man that was accomplished and achieved way more than, um, than than I had in the game of basketball, sending out, you know, a questionnaire and asking me about various, you know, aspects of, you know, basketball life, et cetera. I mean, how could you not stop in, in, take that serious and, and, and want to be part of that, that journey. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I find that to be very important because men like yourself and women, as I mentioned earlier, took time out of their, their lives to help mentor and guide me. I could have easily fallen off the path that I was destined to be on. And I'm, I am a big believer that if, if we're at a fork in the road and everyone goes right, I am going left. And I'm just going to find a different way to get to the finish line going left. I don't want to be like everyone else. I have to be different because, quite frankly, I am different. I am, you know, a non-player, Middle Eastern young man that, you know, you know, didn't come from a privileged basketball background or privileged anything for that matter. So um, I can't go about things the same as everyone else. But I can and will take advice from those that I respect and uh, believe in along the way. And advice comes in the shape of, you know, sit downs and conversations that I've had with both of you. It also comes from observing from afar, which I've done with both of you. And so um, I don't take that stuff lightly. And so, when you know, when you very politely and professionally ask if I would be interested to be in this thing. It's like, hell yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I don't get to sit in this seat that I'm in today without men like yourselves helping me get here. It's just, you know, reality. Um, and if we all take a, a moment and look back on our journeys, uh, you know, it ain't one, two, three, four. We're talking 50 people, hundreds of people that are part of your journey that helped you, you know, get to where you are. Um, I, I have a tattoo on my leg that is my journey. And I got that the year I was out of coaching or, well, I got it once I got back into coaching because I thought about how far I've come along in the journey, how much of a impact I've made in, in various young men's lives, whether they've gone to the NBA and 14 of them proud of every single one. I had many go overseas, but I've had just as many success stories of young men that are real estate agents, IT professionals, in cybersecurity, doctors, actors. I mean, the list goes on. 
that that journey is is fun to look back and now I'm just getting started. So, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to as now these young men have now become men. Heck, they got families before I do. You know, I'm still single and no kids. These guys are are, are you know grown families. You know, we're, we're gonna build we're gonna build an army of uh, people that have you know come through and been coached by Coach Nima and heard you know Coach Nemaisms, uh, and, and yeah. they're gonna they're gonna help each other out. Yes, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to see Eric Green and John Taylor this weekend. Eric Green was drafted by the Denver Nuggets, nation's leading scorer uh, at Virginia Tech. I used to argue with him about sh- not shooting enough. I would it literally, and actually, Coach Adams, your advice back that you gave me, that sat in my head like, Eric, what are you doing? Shoot the ball. I don't need you passing to this other dude on the team. Love him. <laughs> He's going to go play baseball somewhere. You're going to play college basketball. Shoot the ball. And then he becomes the nation's lead scorer. And then a guy like John Taylor, who is a IT professional and is a coach, who I drove him around – to, I want to say, at least 10 uh, elite camps until we finally got that one school to fall in love with him. And he was a four-year starter. Good for him, right? So, you know, those guys know the type of work and effort we put in together. And so when I get to tell them, hey, meet this young man who was just like you back in the day, they're going to be there to mentor them, build them up, just like you guys were there to mentor me and build me up. And and we're just going to curate that community um you know for the rest of eternity wow man that's beautiful so while we got you here and before we close uh times are different times have changed and you are in the belly of the beast baby if you will little dusty rose there share your thoughts on the current state of college basketball nil recruiting anything you want to talk about i am curious uh, to hear your thoughts, because again, you're in the midst of it. We're on the outside. As you saw this weekend, I'm slowly getting back out because the Yacht Coaches podcast looks at things on a national level. Uh, we're going to have an episode that comes out Thursday that shares that most major colleges, Mike, we said transfers because most of the Kids coming in uh, for the 22, 23, and possibly 24 class are going to be transfers. So whatever direction you want to go in, Nima, yeah. what are your current thoughts on the state of college basketball? Absolutely. So let's start right there, you know, with, with the transfer portal. I think it's a great thing. I think, you know, do, you know, I, Paul DeStefano used to have a line about uh, dribbling. So use, use your dribble as a weapon, not a toy. Okay. I would say the transfer portal, same thing. For players, use it as a weapon, not a toy. Don't play with it. Don't be jumping in the portal just because you you know you you die. You think you want to. The reality of college basketball, the reality of life, is you know we have freedom of choice here in the United States of America. Okay, for the most part, and you know you you, you can't tell someone, hey, uh, you you can't go here. You got to stay there. We all made mistakes in life, okay? I go to a school. I don't like it. I figure that out after I'm there. Let the young man go. Let the young man go. And don't hold him out from playing. Um, I once coached a young man named Jay Gavin. Jay Gavin was at Marist, was the rookie of the year at Marist. His coach leaves. He goes to VCU. He goes to VCU to be closer to home because his mother was diagnosed with cancer. He was forced to sit out. During that sit out year, his mother passes away. So he didn't get his mother did not get a chance to see him play and that was her refuge. That was her baby. She wanted those memories in those moments. He wanted those memories with her in those moments. Jay then transfers to Bowie State University, a Division II. Why? Because now his father was then diagnosed with um, cancer. The NCAA says, well, you're a two-time transfer. You got you to sit out. But at this point now, you know, we, we, we're not going to just let – we're not going to lay down and let that happen. And so we, we fought it. And Jay was, was given the ability to play right away. His dad, thankfully – 
beat cancer um, and uh, is, is doing well to this day. But his dad was, was able to come to the games. Jay was taking care of his dad during those times. I say all that to say, like every family has things going on. They, they, they have rights to make decisions. You know, we don't know what one person means to another person's family. It, you know, let, let the kids play. Let the kids play. Now, to the flip side, do college coaches want transfers? Yes, absolutely. Because I now can compare your production to something that's a lot more transferable. Because, quite frankly, there's a lot of bad basketball in high school. And if I go watch a kid play, you're 20 points per game in one uh, part of town is not the same as somebody's 10 points per game in another part of town. And that produces good and bad evaluations on both sides. Okay. In Montgomery County, there were two young men uh, who I guess I can't really name them because uh, yes, I guess don't. Them, but <laughs> there were two young men in Montgomery County who were special elite players that I saw as ninth graders identify said, these guys can play. But the guys they're playing against stunk. It is what it is. There was not another Division One player on their schedule. They are not. They can't make their schedule. Well, one young man changed his uniform his senior year and magically became the 42nd ranked player in the country. All he did was change his uniform. And I saw the same story with, with Eric Green. Eric Green, again, told you earlier, drafted by the Nuggets. We, we couldn't get anyone to recruit him. When he was a public school kid, he changes his uniform, magically goes to Virginia Tech. He did not change his game. We're talking literally within a month in the offseason. Everything changed for him because of the perception. This other young man went to late, very, very late, got one scholarship offer, went to that school, was the rookie of the year in that league, and is now in the ACC. So – we were, it were Those institutions were able to compare those kids to other Division I players and, and get a good read. But, you know, we don't have that luxury in a lot of markets that we recruit. DMV would be one that is excluded. Um, you know, it just is what it is. And so, you know, our jobs are on the line annually. That's just what – that's the reality, Okay. So if our job's on the line, I'm going to take a short thing. Now, high school coaches say, well, you should want to develop guys. You should want to. Yes, I hear you. But, you know, you guys got to do that too, high school coaches, because, you know, there's a whole lot of players that don't know the basics of, you know, a lot of stuff in basketball. And um, I, I quite frankly trust a lot of my college peers much more. Now, coaches that, I have been to their practice. I've seen what they do time and time again. I trust them more in terms of like knowing, like if Mike Francis calls me and says, I got a guy, I'm there tomorrow. But, you know, a lot of times guys don't really know the level of their, their players. And, you know, that's a lot of times what ends up costing, uh, you know, kids to go to the wrong spot in bad decisions. Now also coaches lie. College coaches, they lie. And so you got a lot of kids that get lied to and they go to a place and they're like, yo, you were, you're full of shit. Excuse my language. You're, the mic you're does lie. worse every week. You know, so, so, so that doesn't get reported. That doesn't become a headline. But, you know, if somebody tells you something and you don't do it that way, man, how can I trust you? How can I believe in you? I got to go. So, you know, that happens so often that I think, again, players and those guiding players use the portal as a weapon and not a toy. And that same terminology can go for coach, college coaches. Use it as a, a, a weapon and a tool to improve your program, depending on where you are in, in the state of your program. A lot of schools, I've noticed, they're brand new coaches in terms of like just got a fresh deal. They're recruiting high school kids. If you're kind of on the tail end, you know, we got to win right now. And that's where we are. Um, NIL is great. It's great. There's a lot of money being made in basketball. I'm sitting in a gorgeous house three miles from the beach. 
I don't have this if it ain't for basketball. So who am I to say that the young man that's scoring points or stopping the other guy from scoring points can't earn a living if he's earned it? So I support that wholeheartedly. I want our guys to get what they're worth. Key word is worth. I think there's a lot of misconception on what the value of a lot of players are. Um, so I'll say this. At the highest level where there's money flowing around and there's people that are emotionally invested to winning, are, are people buying players, as Nick Saban alluded to? Yes, of course they are. It is what it is. Guess what? Is that any different than what has been happening in college basketball? No, it isn't. So all the people that are him and hawing, both on the college side or in the media, like y'all, y'all are tripping. Like this is what's been happening. So now, now it's just out in the forefront. Okay, we are competitors. Learn the rules of engagement and compete. <laughs> now, and, A little history person there. Well said. You know, so you know, in the state of South Carolina, as of July first, coaches are allowed to engage and assist in NIL. Okay, so, you know, as of right now, we're, we're airing on the 27th. We're, we're recording on the 27th of June. By the time this airs, you're clean as a whistle, sir. We're, we're, we're able to do that. And so, you know, we're, we're formalizing a plan as to how that could look. But I tell you what, before we do that, and as a coach, it's my job to coach these young men to have a chance to get what they're worth, keyword worth, is, yo, no, you can't get no dough if your social media is looking all crazy. Nobody's going to ask you to do a commercial and promote stuff, their brand on your platform. If you're, if you got reckless behavior out there. Um, so showing them and teaching that and helping them understand that like, sorry, dude, like if you do that, like ain't, ain't nobody going to give you no money. Um, t- teaching them that like, you know, if you want to get paid, understand that that is work. And so you have to do something to, to, to get that. Um, and you better do it with a smile and enthusiasm, but you won't get no more after that. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, that's part of where we are. Reality is many young men and young women uh, in, in college athletics, especially at the mid major level and lower they're not really adding a whole lot of value to, uh, you know, a brand or a business. So you better be creative and thinking about, you know, how can I be an attractive candidate for NIL? Well, where does my marketability lie? Um, I recall recruiting a young man that had long, crazy hair. I'm bald. So I respect somebody with with some good hair Um, and, you know, telling them, you know, before the NIL era, hey, man, you come here, I'm going to convince our marketing department to, to do a, a, a night where we give out wigs where their hair looks like you, and that's going to help build your brand. Well, now with NIL, man, let's really do that, and let's get a sponsor to stick their name on it, and you do a commercial for a shampoo company or a barbershop in town or whatever. So being st- strategic and creative which is something that I've done throughout my career and I get excited about ide- ideating um, different ways to, you know, again, be different. If everyone goes right, I'm going left uh, and, and help these players uh, get what they're worth. Uh, I'm, I'm all about it. On the front end, let's add value to your name so you are worth something um, to, to help you get to where you're going to go. Uh, and then, you know, let's educate within the law again in South Carolina in about, you know, four days from, from the moment where we're sitting at today, it will be law that we can openly talk about it, but not every state has that. And you know, now you get into the space where, you know, some schools are at a competitive disadvantage while I'm sitting in South Carolina, I say, boo hoo sucks for you. But you know, that's, that's something that, you know, ultimately legislators out there, You know, you represent your jurisdiction, your county, your state. Uh, Coastal Carolina University is a state school. So our 
lawmakers decided, hey, let's pass something that is going to help the state school that people in this state have passion for. That's smart by those politicians. I think we'll see a lot of that quickly. Yeah, well, there's no question. There's no question, Mike. There's no doubt. Clemson and South Carolina football, 100%. But, hey, but here we are. But there, you can benefit. We're going to take advantage of it. Exactly. Learn there's no question because here's the thing. What you can there's other states where some of us may or may not be from that don't have that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, I know one lawmaker, may he rest in peace, if he was still alive, he would have had that thing already passed, um, you know, from, from our great state of Maryland. So, you know, like that, that's just what it is. So slowly but surely that'll all come around and, and, you know, kids and their families will be able to benefit because last I checked, when I go to an NCAA tournament, all seven that I've been to, packed arena, oh so you know, sold out tickets that weren't like fifty dollars. We're talking three hundred dollars to sit on the roof. I walk if I'm walk, I'm walking into the arena with a cup of something to drink, and they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! You can't walk in there with that cup. You got to walk in with this cup." <laughs> we walk it into the locker room or into the arena where they putting you through a metal detector. And they open your, your travel bag and they're like, oh, you got Gatorade? Can't do that. You got to drink Powerade. And they take it and throw it away because there is a hefty, hefty contract that somebody is benefiting from. Okay, so now that, you know, that access is going to turn a little bit. That's fine. That's good. You know, everybody's just got to adjust. There's more than enough resources to go around. Um, let's, let's allow the people that – um, or put it in the, the work and the blood, sweat, and tears to, to benefit from that, um, but benefit from it from the right way. And, oh, by the way, the most marketable people thus far in this NIL era are female college yes. athletes, which is and, spectacular. And what you don't know, uh, Nemo, because you're probably on the road, but Mike and I throughout our year in existence – has covered everything you've talked about. So that is outstanding reinforcement for us in terms of state legislators making good and bad decisions. Uh, so Mike, I know you're chomping at the bit. There's a couple of things Nima said that you definitely want to piggyback on. The floor is yours, my friend. I just want to applaud you for everything you've done and you accomplished, man. I feel, I feel good calling you a friend uh, from your time, everywhere you've been. You've never big-timed me. I, I can't remember one time I didn't call you and you didn't either say, hey, I'm in a meeting or I'll hit you back when I'm doing this. Or, I'm watching a kid play or or you answered and you always followed through. That's one thing about you, Nima, that I give you credit for. Not too many, but, you know, as a tight group of people, yourself, uh, Eddie Jackson, Lamar Barrett, you guys, we've all been you know, very tight and following through where some guys you work with just, you know, you, you find that out over time. They just, if you're not benefiting them, they don't reach out to you or call. So I thank you for that. And thank Nima, you. can you put on the screen, cause our uh, fine super producer Kelly will put it on the screen, your social media, where our fans can follow you, uh, where players can follow you. Uh, please, uh, what's your social media information? And Super Producer Kelly will take care of it, sir, because we'll take care of you. Yeah, my, you, you know, you can find me on, on social media, both Twitter and Instagram, at Nima, N-I-M-A-O-M-I-D-V-A-R. It's just my full name, Nemo Midvar. Uh, one of the perks of being, you know, in the, in the onset of social media is that uh, I got my name as my, my handle. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, I love to, to brag about where I'm at and, and all those around me and, and all those that have been in my journey. So if you're going to follow me, you're going to, you're going to get a heavy dose of basketball related content. Um, the, the uniform that's hanging behind, uh, coach Francis, who is, you know, uniform is of his son, even though I know he doesn't cheer for that team. You know, you, you'll get uh, both good and bad tweets about the Washington Commanders. Uh, still struggle saying that, but, you know, that, that, that's about what we put it That's the, 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 the contact and contents that I get. But I will say this. I've also really uh, decided uh, 
consciously as a coach that I'm going to follow back more coaches and more mm. programs. Yes. Um, yes. And what I do is I organize it in, in various lists because, you know, like I, I think I followed, I was looking at it on the airplane today about 3,500 people. I don't know, you know, intimately 3,500 people, but I do know this because of the portal, because of the way recruiting goes, the way the world is going. I now have a direct access to communicate with you, and you have a direct access. To yes, communicate. yes. And what Francis alluded to, when people hit me up, I may not get back to you right away, but I might hit you and be like, "Yo, I'll get back to you." Like, I'm, I got your message. I'm with you. And so, in you know, evenings like tonight, I, I spent time and communicating with whomever and whatever uh, to either give back to the game or to to get to know new people um, because that's how relationships are born. And uh, that's how the you know my career will continue to move forward because uh, my career cannot move forward unless I have new young men coming into the program to help realize their goals and dreams. You have to. I remember you on Spaces not that long ago on Twitter. You were speaking on Spaces too, giving back to coaches and giving them advice about being in the business. And that's something we don't do enough of. And I try where I'm at in my area. I try to grab the young guys and pull them in and like kind of help them along the way for what they're going to see. So I, I do appreciate you for that as well. That that spaces on Twitter is definitely a good idea. As a matter of fact, we've talked about watching a couple games or uh, having a. We just got to figure room, it out. We're old. yeah, room for ourselves. We don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nemo, on my end, um, I just want to say I'm proud of you, man. Uh, to hey. be someone who has seen your career from the very start, uh, from you being a runner at everybody's everything to being the accomplished coach you are now. And, and I'm the one reaching out to you. And uh, as you said, this is an interview that was months in the making because real life is real and we're so respectful of the process. And uh, we just, you know, we're taping on the night we don't usually tape because you're, you're important to us too. And we want people to hear your story and young players, young coaches, uh, old coaches. Uh, it's about the work. So I appreciate you being flexible as well uh, with your time. And uh, this has just been wonderful to catch up. It's been too long. I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you get something out of it. I hope you get a chuckle because Fowler and wrote the forward uh, to the book. So I'm sure you're going to laugh at some of that stuff when you get a chance. Um, so uh, on behalf of my tag team partner, Coach Mike Francis and our good friend, Coach Nima, because he's still Nima to us. He's still 19 to me, and I got to stop that. Uh, I am Dr. Keith Adams. I'll stay 19. I'm good with that. <laughs> I have Dr. Keith Adams saying thank you for listening and or watching the iCoaches podcast, and we will see you on the sidelines. Until next time, take care. We hope you enjoyed today's show. The iCoaches podcast drops new episodes every Tuesday through Friday on most weeks. Make sure you subscribe to the iCoaches podcast on Apple Music, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Spotify, and YouTube. Follow the Odd Coaches podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Odd Coaches. Follow Dr. Adams on Twitter and Instagram at CKA Save Project. In addition, follow Coach Mike Francis on Twitter and Instagram at Coach Franchise, spelled Coach F R A N C H I Z E. For more information about the CKA Save Project, please visit them on the web at www.ckasaveproject.org. See you next time on the Odd Coaches podcast.